Genesis chapter 11. <laughs> So now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet seen. By faith Enoch was translated, and he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Alright. Dear my Father, we thank you again for the ability to be here today, Lord. Uh, just come, Lord, and uh, worship you, Lord. I pray you would just speak the words tonight, Lord. Pray you would speak through me, give me words to say, Lord. I pray you would just help me to uh, say all that you would have me to say, Lord. And say nothing that you don't want me to say, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would just bless and um, give me words here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we see here it says that without faith it is impossible to please God. Everything that we do as Christians. Everything to be—I mean—to become a Christian, you have to put your faith in God. To to receive God's salvation, you have to put your faith in God. But to live as a Christian and to please God, you have to have faith. You have to trust Him. It says in verse six, "For he that cometh to God must believe that He is." So we have to believe that God is real. We have to believe that this is the Word of God and that what it says is true. And it says that He is the rewarder of them who diligently seek. So we have to believe that if we diligently seek God, He will reward us. We have to believe that He has our best interests at heart. I want to go to Acts. Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. Verse 1, it says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' bank, and entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And then we go down to verse 9. It says, Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Now, if I were uh, Brother Hewitt, uh, I would say this passage is. Uh, the gospel according to the crew. Uh, and we're going to look kind of at, uh, at, it, at the aspect of salvation. I see here that the centurion does not believe Paul. And as we know that Paul is the man of God and he's telling him what God told him. In that sense, the centurion does not believe God. God told them not to go into the ship. He told them to stay. But the centurion believed the master of the ship more than he believed God. If we look at verses, verse 14, it says, But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called the Euryclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up under the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Plata, we had much work to come by the boat which, when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing, lest they should fall into the quicksands. Straight, sa straight sail, and so were driven. And we, being exceedingly tossed to the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling the ship, and when neither sun nor stars, and many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So in that first passage that we read, 
we saw their situation. We saw that as the centurion did not believe God and he did not trust God, but he trusted the master of the ship, they got into a storm and they got into a situation that they can't get out of. And in this passage, verses 14 through 20 that we just read, we see they're striving. We see that they're working, they're trying to get out of the situation. It says they ran under a certain island, which is called Clada, and we have much work to come by the boat. So we see that they're, they're working and they're trying to, to get out of the storm, but there's nothing they can do. It says, and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, in verse 15, it says we let her drive. It means they just let it go. They, there was nothing they could do to fix the situation they were in. And if we look at verse 21, it says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from free, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given me all them that sail with thee. Here I see God's mercy. We saw earlier that Paul said that their voyage would cause great loss, not only in the ship, but also of the souls on the ship. But here we see that God chooses to be merciful and to save the lives of those on the ship. And God didn't have to show mercy. God didn't have to uh, choose to show grace, but he did. And we need to be thankful for God's grace and mercy. And even when we get ourselves in these situations, we saw the, the centurion, he could have said, no, we're going to stay. We're not going to go out into the storm. But instead he didn't. And he got himself and the crew got themselves into that situation. But even sometimes when we get in ourselves into bad situations, and when we're, we're lost in our sin and we mess everything up, God still has mercy on us and He pulls us out. Amen. And we need to be thankful for that. The next thing I see is their impatience. In verse 25 it says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded, and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and found it fifteen fathoms. Then, fearing, lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern, and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, he cannot be saved. So here I see that they, they see land and they realize they're close to land. And as they see that, they're in a hurry to get out. And they're in a hurry to get to that land. And God tells them that if they try to get out of the ship and go to the land, that they will not be saved. You know, sometimes when we're struggling and we're going through hard times in our life, and we, we see daylight and we see easier times, we see something to make life better, we want to jump for it and go for it, but there's times when God hasn't brought us to that place yet, and He's still preparing us. And we need to be patient and wait for Him to bring us where He's taking us to. I can think of uh, so many times throughout the past few years, just everything going on, and as soon as I see things look like they're starting to get easier, it seems like something else breaks down, or something, something goes wrong, but if you just trust God, He will get you to where He's taking you. And then the next thing I see is their faith. It says, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take me, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that he had carried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Having taken nothing. Nothing. Uh, not all. Wherefore I pray you, take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not hair and fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. 
Then were they all good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship. And we were in all in the ship, two hundred threescore and sixteen souls. So we see here that they trusted what God said. They cut off the ropes of the boat and they let it fall. Which that was that was their way of escape, and that was in their human thinking, in their mind, that was their way out. But because God said not to, they decided to trust God and to let it go. Sometimes we're going to have to let go of the things that we believe in. We're going to have to, to let go of the things that, that make sense to us, that we think are going to get us into a better situation because that's what God says and because we're trusting Him. Then if we look at chapter 28, verse 1. All right, well, let's go ahead and finish reading the rest of that chapter. Verse 38. It says, And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore, into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves to the sea, and loosed the rudder band, and hoist up the mainsails to the wind, and made for shore. And falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards, and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all, save the land. I see here their deliverance. As they waited on God, as they trusted Him, God brought them to this island. And, and He delivered them from the storm. And if you look at the first verse of chapter 28, it says, when, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melissa. Now this word melita, if you look it up, the meaning of this word in Greek is a place of refuge. Now if we just trust God and if we have faith in Him, He will bring us to a place of refuge. It may be hard getting there, and it, may take, it will take patience, and it's going to take faith. But if we just have faith and if we trust Him, He'll bring us to that place of refuge. But if we decide to trust in our own ways, if we decide to trust in our own understanding, then we'll ruin everything. And we'll be worse off than we were before. We've got to trust God. You know, I, I see a beautiful picture of salvation in this passage. And we know that all a sinner must do to be delivered from sin is believe. But so often we forget that as Christians, we won't be delivered from our situation, whatever it may be, all we have to do is believe. All we have to do is trust. Let's turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 30, 37. Genesis 37. Verse 3 it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him, and did not speak peaceably unto him. Now if we look at verse 23. So then it came to pass, when Joseph was come to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brother were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And if we look at chapter 39, verse 1. Chapter 
39, verse 1. So then Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, fought him with the hand of Ishmael, which had brought him down to them. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass, from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So I see here that Joseph, he gets sold to the Egyptian, well, he gets sold to the Midianites, which then sold him to the Egyptians. And his own brothers were the ones that did it. His own brothers turned against him and sold him eventually into the hands of the Egyptians. But yet we see here that as he sold to Potiphar, we see that it says that God was with him. It says the Lord was with Joseph. And I believe the reason that the Lord was with Joseph is because Joseph stayed close to God. Uh, as we just studied James, the verse says, draw nigh to God and he shall draw nigh to you. So if we want God to be close to us, we need to draw close to God. So I see that hey, Joseph, as he was going through his hard time, as he was going through his struggle, he stayed close to God and he trusted him. And he did his best in the situation that he was in. No doubt Joseph... As he got sold to the Egyptians, he could have had a horrible attitude and he could have said, well, I'm just going to do the worst that I can, I'm going to be miserable, and hopefully they'll kill me. But we see here that Joseph was diligent, and he, and he worked hard, he did his best in the situation that he was in to glorify God. Then if we look at verse 7, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with him. But he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither have he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not to her, to lie by her, or be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there with him. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, and fled, and got him out. So I see here that as Potiphar's wife is tempting Joseph, he refuses, and he rejects the temptation. And sometimes Satan tempts us, especially when we're going through hard times, Satan will tempt us. And he will, he will bring things along the way that, that look like they'll make life better, that look like they'll make life easier. But really, it's just going to hurt us and make us, put us in a worse state. But we see here that Joseph resisted the temptation of the devil, and he trusted God, but he also had a grateful heart. It says in verse 9, There is none greater in this house than I, neither have he kept back anything from me but thee, talking about Paul. It says, Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So Joseph doesn't decide to, to look at his life and say, oh, poor me, poor me, I'm in such a, a horrible situation. No, he decides to look at the good things in his life. He decides to look at what God's given him and be grateful for it. And he resists the temptation of the devil because he's thankful for what God's given him. And there's so many times I know, especially in my own life, when I fail the temptation, when I fall to sin, if I think about it, it's because, in a way, because I'm not being grateful. Because I'm not being thankful for what God's given me. It's because I'm focusing on what I don't have and not focusing on what I do. You know, if, if we're praising God and thanking God for what He's given us, we don't have time to be depressed and sad and, and, and focusing on what we don't have. So in times of trial and times of trouble, we have to have a grateful heart. If we look at verse 16, chapter 39, verse 16. It says, And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, 
when his master heard the words of his wife, which she, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was tender. And Joseph's master took him, and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him mercy, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. We see here that even after Joseph stayed faithful, even after he resisted Satan's temptations, even after he did the right thing, things still didn't go well for him. He still was thrown into prison and, and things got harder for him even than they already were. Yet he still trusted God. It says in verse 21, that the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the people of the prison. And because of Joseph's diligence and his, his uh, pers perseverance and his trust in God, it says the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And then if we keep reading, it says, And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it possible. So even in, in this time of trial, even though he was already going through a trial and it just got worse, he still trusted God. If we look at chapter 40, verse 1 through 15, it says, And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their Lord the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers, and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard, and in the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he, and he served them, and they continued to see them in war. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night. Each man, according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly to death? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them. Tell me them, I pray thee. I see here that he still glorified God, even, even through all that he'd been through. Even through being sold to the Egyptian, Egyptians, being thrown into prison when he had done nothing wrong, he still glorifies God. He says, do not interpretation belong to God. He says, he tells them, I can't do it. I can do nothing, but God can. If you look at verse 9, it says, And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. And it was though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee to thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee. And show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. And make mention of me and the Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. And then if we look at verse 23, it says, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. So we see here, again, as, as Joseph stays faithful, as he, as he glorifies God, the chief butler forgot him. He still did not get delivered from his situation. He was still in the prison as a slave. But if you look at chapter 41, verse 9, chapter 41, verse 9, it says, Then spake the chief butler and the Pharaoh, saying, I will remember my fault to this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he, and dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew servant, the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man, according to his dream, we did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored me to my office, 
ันเทศเป็นไงสุดท้ายฟาโรห์ sent all Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh and Pharaoh said unto Joseph is not I have dreamed a dream and there is none that can interpret it and I have heard say of thee thou canst understand a dream to interpret it and Joseph answered Pharaoh saying it is not in me God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. We see here he's still being faithful. After all this time, as a slave and as a prisoner, he stays faithful. He trusts God. Now, if I was Joseph, I probably would have given up after I got sold to the Egyptians and became a slave. But not only did Joseph get sold to the Egyptians, he, he became a prisoner for reasons that or for false accusations, he became a prisoner. And then he had what seemed like a, a chance to get out, and it didn't happen. He, he, he was still in that prison for a great time. But even through all of this, through, through, through all that he's gone through, through all the bad times, he stays faithful. He says, God shall give, an answer, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. We look at verse 28. Verse 28. It says, This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. When God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following. For it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring to pass. Now therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man who is free and wise, and set him from the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and then appoint officers of the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt, and seven money is used. And then we go to verse 37. It says, And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed me all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in a vesture of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, Bow to me. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And verse 15 and 51. It says, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. Which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called him Ephraim, for God hath called me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. We see here that God delivers him. As Joseph stayed faithful, and he had patience and trusted God through everything he went through, God delivered him. But not only did he deliver him, he delivered him and he brought himself glory in the very place of Joseph's despair. It says he called the name of the, his first son Manasseh. For God said, well for God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil. It says that Joseph said that God made him forget all his toil. He made him forget all the hard times he'd been through, all the struggle he went through, being imprisoned un unrighteously, God made him to forget it. Basically, he's saying it was worth it. It was worth